Belinda, thank you so much. I'm super, super excited by this, by the way. But thank you so much for joining me on the Quantum Creating Podcast. And how are you this wonderful way? It looks wonderful where you are, Day. It's glorious. I brought the sunshine with me. Um, absolutely amazing. And I just want to say thank you. Thank you so much for bringing me on board with this fantastic podcast and, and the tribe, you know, the great things that you're creating as well. So it's an honor. I'm so, so happy to be here and pretty blessed. And I can't wait to, to share some stories and have a bit of a chat with you. Oh, fabulous. Thank you so much for that. And, 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 you know, um, Thanks for taking time out your incredibly busy schedule to do this. And it, it kind of, it got me thinking a little bit, you know, that one of the, the, the main things I hear from people when we're talking about peak performance and optimal living and creating a legacy and that kind of thing is people tend to turn around and say, it's all right for you, but I just don't have time. So how do you make time to do things like this? For the right people, and that's something that I've learned over the years for the right people, you move mountains <laughs> and it's got to be the right people with the right message with shared values. And I will create hours in a day. Like I did yesterday. I'm working on an hour and a half sleep, by the way, that's not what to do as an optimal performance athlete. I do not recommend it, but there are occasions in our life that we need to do that. And there are occasions when we get limited sleep or we have to do things but that's, that's what life is about. It's about creating opportunities. And it's about, when you talk about creating a legacy, it's about giving back. Mm. And if that means you have to miss a little bit of sleep or you have to go above and beyond, then that's what you do. For the right people, that's how you make it happen. That's, that's truly fabulous. And, and, and I concur. And um, it's funny you talk about um, endurance athlete because um, you certainly have made time for that over the years. And, and your story and the way you got involved in that is just outrageous. Um, how does one become involved in something so incredible when they have all sorts of trials and tribulations just to live a normal life? <laughs> Look, like, you know, like you with your background as a, as a pro athlete, we, we, life is a roller coaster. We're going to get things thrown our way no matter what. Failure is inevitable in, in what we do. Failure doesn't determine the success longer term, though. So how I see it is that you're given one life, one precious life on this earth anyway, depending upon your religious beliefs. And you have to make it so that it's an amazing one because, mm. and you know, you obviously you've heard a little bit about my story and I lost my mom, you know, she was in her forties. She never got to see us grow up. She never got to see graduation. You know, she never got to see her and um, my niece and nephew, her grandchildren. And she left this planet with things unsaid, mm. with things not completed and she was you know she didn't um you know she wasn't in any way regretful of that but reflecting upon the amazingly remarkable and beautiful human being she was i think she had that one life and she did the best she could absolutely she did but i think it also it's a reminder and sometimes we have to go through traumas in order to actually see our pathway. And I almost think that's a recipe. And, and like you, I study in this field also as well. And for every single peak performer, everybody that's working optimally and that's living their best life, they've gone through some pretty tough times mm. of varying degrees. You'll know yourself as a pro athlete, you get injured, you fall down, you get back up again. Your tendons, ligaments sometimes don't keep up with your, you know, the, the actual muscle growth. <laughs> Um, yes, and they will. snap and break. Um, so, you know, I think that's a really a bit of a metaphor for life as mm. well. That sometimes we want to grow bigger than what we're ready for and things break. Um, mm. And I think in answer to your question, you make it happen. Mm. Whatever you're given in life, you take it and you turn it into the good. The glass isn't half empty. It's not half full. We're just absolutely honored to have the glass. Mm. Some people don't have that. No, this is true. And when we spoke off air a little earlier, you mentioned a phrase that I underlined and put in a little box because I think it's absolutely key, um, especially given what you've just said. And that was being bold. We have to be bold. We have to yeah. be bold with ourselves. We have to be bold with our relationships. We have to be bold with our businesses. We have to be bold. 
Yeah. And take risks as mm. well. You know, with boldness comes fear. And, you know, and as we know how our brains are hardwired to be fearful, to protect us, mm. if we know that is the case and we learn enough about the human brain, we can put coping strategies in place. Yeah. Um, And I think that's going back to your original question of how do you do that? It's having those coping strategies in place to be bold, to know that the reality is you're going to fail. The wheels are going to fall off at some point in what you're doing. Performance is going to you or your performance in some way isn't going to go perfectly. So what are you going to do when that happens? What's your backup plan? What's your backup plan? Uh, 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 Going from the trauma of losing your mother at such a young age, was that the the line in the sand moment? Was that the point in your life where you you said to yourself, look, I'm going to make sure that I'm going to do all those things that I want to do in my life. I'm going to, I'm going to do some outrageous, some incredible uh, adventures and, and tasks because we only get one shot of this. Was it the moment that you was defining for you and stepped you forward into this crazy stuff that you do? <laughs> it was, there's a couple. So I would say the being born with the disability was the big one and being told that I would have to adapt my life because I wasn't going to do the sports, um, regardless of the fact that I had calipers on, I think until about the age of five and I wore those down and the healthcare system only provided I think one a year or something. And I was going through like one every couple of months because I was moving around so much. Mm. Um, And I think, you know, that was one of the pivotal points, but it took my mum passing for it to trigger what had already happened previously. So it was an accumulation and I was involved in a car accident and a number of uh, really serious car accident. Um, Not my fault, I'm a good driver. Um, It was a truck driver that fell asleep at the wheel, unfortunately. Um, So no no jokes about not being able to drive properly. Um, So yeah, I think it was a, a combination of all of those factors they were almost, uh, we talk about the snowballing effect in mm. research, where, you know, it's like that gathering of, of, of snow as you go, rapidly go down a, a mountain, for example. And it was only at that point when I, I walked back into the room, I just stepped out of the room and my mum closed her eyes and took her breath for the very, very last time. And she went to sleep for the very last time that it wasn't until dealing with that trauma, it took me many, many years to get mm. over it, that it was a catalyst. It was right. all of those pieces finally came together and said, do I use this fire that's within me, which was destroying me for the good? Right. Or do I let it and allow it to destroy me? And I wasn't willing to do that. You know, no. my mom had already been taken um, and, you know, and lots of other things, as, as, as you know, in life, we, everybody listening to this now, you know, just nod your head if you've gone through something similar, because whoever's listening to this will be nodding their head saying, we've all got our stories. So in answer to your question, I think we, Malcolm Gladwell in his book, he talks about the tipping point. Yeah. So the tipping point for me was all of those things and then it got to the point where she um, she closed her eyes and and that was it for me. But it took me a little bit of a time to mm. to realize that. And I thought, do we step forward into greatness or do we step back and allow that trauma to destroy? And she was the happiest, but most beautiful woman and the happiest person on the planet. Mm. And I thought I she asked me to carry the message on, you know, to make sure that people live a life fulfilled. Right. So which is why I'm here talking to you. If it wasn't for her, you know, you know, maybe I wouldn't be here. You know, maybe her passing has created, um, you know, a, a ripple effect. Um, it's a great legacy. Like, you know, we, we've spoken before about legacy um, yeah. and, and having a legacy and creating a legacy. And in that regard, your mum certainly did that because you are here spreading happiness, spreading joy, spreading peak performance, optimal living, and you're doing it with a big smile on your face and engaging all those around you, which is truly magnificent because so many people live lives of quiet despair and don't see the happiness and the joy in what they're doing. How do these people start to change that paradigm and step forward into happiness, step forward into joy? I think there's often, and it's as much as this is, 
um, as difficult to say you have to hit rock bottom. Mm. I've, I've not found somebody that I've worked with or my company or anybody that we've been into contact with that has suffered illness or um, they've suffered loss, for example, that hasn't had that tipping point, you know, that, um, that moment in time where they decide that they can't do this any longer. Um, you know, and that, that tipping point of that mental wellness, you know, we talk about the spectrum of wellness versus unwellness. And I think, unfortunately, you do have to sometimes hit that rock bottom point. Mm. The biggest turning point is your decision. Yeah. So anybody that's listening to this podcast today, it has to be your decision. You know, your husband, your wife, your partner, your coach, your um, friend, your family member, you know, Karen from the local shop, they can't make this decision for you. It's got to be you. Mm. And it's got to be you being bold enough, being brave enough and saying, this is not the life I signed up for. Yeah. This is not my true purpose. A um, little bit of spirituality in that, but there has to be that point where you say, no more. Mm. This is not what I'm put on this earth for. The enough is enough point, I call it, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, when the floodgates of, you know, I suppose when you look at the floodgates and you can no longer push that back and you think, well, do I let that, you know, that tsunami of unhappiness or sadness or whatever it is you're feeling right now in your life that can consume you mm. or it can fuel you and you can fly free. Mm. So, you know, it's, I think you have to make that decision. And unfortunately some people don't make that decision. And as we know, then, um, you know, um, the, the lives change yeah. um, quite dramatically. But I think anybody who's listening to this, who's at that tipping point, I can say, you know, we're both here now and you've interviewed many great people also as well who've been there and we've come out the other end mm. and we have the most phenomenal life by being brave, yeah, by absolutely. stepping up. Absolutely. It's interesting that you mention uh, allowing it to fuel you rather than consume you. Um, as you know, I, I used to box. Um, yeah. I love, I still love my boxing today. I still watch as much of it as I can. Um, and Mike Tyson's first mentor, the late great Customato, was famous for talking about fear and how fear is like a fire. And you fan the fire and it can warm you or it can destroy you. And I've always used that as an analogy with despair, with fear, with pain, that, that we have the ability to look at what's happening and in that moment make a decision and choose. And, and, and this is the, the word that I love to use with people, choose how it, it defines you and how you're going to move forward with it. Yeah, absolutely. And you'll have found that with, you know, the, the fantastic clients that, that you work with as well. It's, it's a process. Yeah, definitely. You know, the, the brain is often considered an object almost, and it is, um, but it's also a process. And we have to, as you know, work through that process and it can't be overnight for some people. No. The process of adaptation takes many, many years. Mm -hmm. It does. Yeah. For some, it can be, you know, a couple of months. For others, it can be decades. And for some, they never get to that point no. of adaptation. No. So, um, you know, I think that's something that, you know, as with the clients that you work with, it's about that journey. And you hear it all the time, don't you? You hear all of these people pontificating. It's about the journey. I mean, I've heard it so many times. But it is. Mm. You know, I'm, I, as you know, I'm, I'm training to climb Mount Everest. It's a process. It's a journey. Would I love to run up it in 24 hours and get it just done? Of course I would. But I also know that it's a process and it takes weeks and weeks to get there. And to do something well, it does take time. Yeah. But, you know, it's, it's worth it in the end, though. So, so you have your, your moment of uh, Satori, as they say, uh, you know, of clarity of, right, I'm going to go and I'm going to do this and I'm going to make this difference and I'm going to do all these wonderful things. Where did you start? I mean, because, you know, a little birdie tells me you have a real love-hate relationship with yams on mountainsides, for instance. I mean, what's going on there, Belinda? 
So the, I, I said I would share the yak story because it's quite an interesting yak story. So look, let, let's relate this to what we're talking about in terms of peak performance. And so we talk about the journey. So we were on the mountainside, we were heading to Everest Base Camp and we were climbing for a cancer foundation and also, um, and also a foundation to enable and empower women to, um, to free themselves from, um, from villages and, and some of the challenging regions in which they, they live in. So the desire to be there was pretty high. Right. So, but we, we all decided that we were going to go on a journey, literally and metaphorically. So as we were climbing up um, towards um, Everest Base Camp, as a mountaineer, you always stay mountainside. Right. So it's, it's almost like being on a road, you always stay towards the curb. It's the safer way in the middle, anything could happen. So as we were climbing up, I was with, and she, she doesn't mind me telling the story with Dr. Sue. Um, I was with Dr. Sue when we were chatting away and we could hear a bell. Now I don't have, I, I did actually purchase a yak bell um, as a reminder to, to, to never give up because we, um, we nearly, you know, we nearly died that day. So you can imagine just hearing a little bit of a sound, a tiny yeah. little bit of a sound, just a ring and a ring, and it gets louder and louder and louder and closer and closer, and you suddenly look up. And as you look up, you've got at least, I don't know, 12 to 16 yaks, a couple of hundred kilograms each, herding towards you down a hill, gathering pace. There's nowhere to go. We weren't mountainside, we drifted across. There was only one way we were going, and that was down. And it was a sheer drop. Oh. At one point, I looked over at Dr. Sue, I was more to her right hand, and she's holding the horns of the yak. She's literally holding these yaks back from pushing us off the mountain until she couldn't push and hold anymore because it was a couple of hundred kilograms. And no matter how strong she was, and she moved the yak she moved the yak horns and we both fell over the side of the mountain. Wow. I don't know how, and I think this is also a bit of a sign, I think as well in terms of, I grabbed, I'm left-handed. I grabbed the only small tree twig that was coming out and my leg had jammed at the top and I fell backwards. I held it and held on for dear life. And Dr. Sue had fallen somehow on my hip. Now, thankfully, this is one time when a woman would say, I'm really glad about my hips, strong hips. I was able to support her as her leg was jammed. I remember looking down and just seeing an abyss, just seeing rocks and a drop. And I remember saying to myself, it's not your time to die, Belinda. And after I told the story, I've only told the story a couple of times. And, and after I shared the story with someone close to me, they said, you must tell that story. Mm. Said, but why? Who would want to know? And they said, what a great example of life. Mm. You know, making that decision that it's not your time to give up, not necessarily death, but, you know, it's not your time to give up on that job, yeah. on that person. You know, there might be somebody listening that, you know, is... Um, wants a family it might not be your time to give up on that family it might not be your time to give up on that relationship or that boss who's not very good so just back to the story the yak herder had gone past the yaks had gone past by this point and there was no way up thankfully the yak herder stopped and he managed to pull he, he reached all the way down and pull dr sue up and managed to get hold of her arm battled to get her up, but then I couldn't get up because I had my backpack on and I was stuck. Wow. Because my leg was vertical, so imagine if you've got the rock face here vertically and then I've got my legs stuck. Now I'm flexible, but one thing I can't do is bend my body in two. Right, no. Yeah, that's not what a mountaineer does. No, you know, it's not, what, it's not like 101 in mountaineering. So eventually I managed to bend my knee and they pulled me up and over using my backpack. And I remember being on my hands and knees covered in dirt, looking back down and thinking, I nearly died. There's so many of those experiences that I've had over the years that for me, again, it was a reminder to use what happened because we all fall. We all fall mm -hmm. off the cliff. 
at some point, you know, we, we, we derail. But using that as an example about life, that we are going to fall, <laughs> and it hurts. It really hurts. <laughs> but then we get back up again, mm. you know, and it's not deterred me. It's taught me that, you know, sometimes we have to stay in our lane. Mm -hmm. If I'd stayed in my lane, I would have been closer to the mountainside. And sometimes it's okay to wander. It's okay to be bold and it's okay to step outside. But it's also never okay to give up on whatever your dreams are. So, you know, that day we decided it wasn't our time to go. Um, and thankfully we got up and we carried on and we got to the base camp. And, um, you know, there's, there's our pictures of us at base camp. And I head back there in 2021 to go to the summit wow. because I decided that it, it wasn't my time. Yeah. Incredible. And I, and I guess that um, doing all this training for these endurance type events, the climbing mountains and glaciers and whatnot, you, you come across some great lessons that you can extrapolate for life and business as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's what it's about. It's about using our shared experiences mm. to share those across and tell the stories. For many years, I never told the story. I was maybe 39, 38, <clears throat> giving my age away. <laughs> We can edit that out, don't one. worry. Yeah, yeah, I was, <laughs> it was only a couple of years ago that I started to share the story right. about my leg and the disability because I was ashamed. All right. you know, I used to cover it up. I didn't used to wear certain things because of my leg size was different. So what but changed, think, Belinda? What, cha what, what changed from having that as, as an embarrassment or something you didn't want to share and, and being so transparent about it and authentic about it? I think again, you know, we talked about those little moments in time yeah. where it starts to accumulate and it started to accumulate. And I question why was I doing that? What was I fearful of people's judgment? Mm. Because I'd had that my whole of my life yeah. that people had said, oh, look at her leg and, you know, bullying and teasing. But then I thought, own it. If I'm going to get to the highest mountains on each continent, go to the North and South Pole, run ultra marathons then why not use that? There is somebody listening to your podcast today that will listen to that and say, if she can do it, I can do it. Absolutely. And that's why, you know, it's the ability to know that that could impact someone. Um, and, you know, not in, um, not in a way that is, um, is complex. It's just a simple story about what happened in life. And, like you, you know, I wasn't born into advantage. You know, I wasn't born yeah. with um, super DNA. I wasn't born as an athlete, you know, like you as a, an athlete, I trained extra. When the gym closed, I was still there. Yeah. You know, I was there before the gym opened. I always do extra. I brush my teeth standing on one leg to try and keep the balance on my leg. Nobody sees that. Um, I thought I was the only person that did things like that. <laughs> Clearly not. <laughs> And look, and that's the difference, you know, we, we talk about what's the difference with peak performers. It's that ability to go that, just that extra little bit, you know, that difference between good and great. Mm. Um, you know, that ability to be grateful and to be blessed um, and to realize that we have, you know, I, I, I go back to the original point that, you know, we live once mm -hmm. on this earth anyway, and, you know, let's make it the best possible, um, you know, best possible journey that yeah. we have, regardless of what life throws at us. No, absolutely. Um, I, I'm interested in your thoughts on this. Um, can anyone be a peak performer? <laughs> Good question. The nature nurture debate. It's the same conversation I have about leaders. Can anybody be a leader? Look, I'm going to go out on a limb and I'm going to say, yes, it's mm. a choice. Mm. You know, anybody can be a driver. Anybody can be a runner. Anybody can be a CEO if that's what you choose to do. Mm. So can everybody do it? Yes. Is everybody capable of doing it? Most probably not. No. Mm. And, and people need to be okay with that, right? You know, um, uh, you know, yeah. I talk to a lot of people and a lot of people that I don't actually coach because they're not ready for this type of coaching. Okay. And, and I, I make the point that it's okay, you know, where you are, what station in life you're at, what resources you've got. You can always increase them. You can always change them. But if you decide that that's where you're best served, then so be it, you know, and just go at that with the, the best enthusiasm you can. 
Yeah, I think, isn't there a propensity now with this Insta world and this mm. Facebook and Twitter and, and now it's TikTok? I believe so. I mean, I'll have to speak yeah. to my kids about it. I really don't. No idea. Um, my, my social media person now is now most probably listening to this shaking her head. Yeah. Um, but, you know, that's I stay in my lane with those things. Um, and I definitely know it's not my thing. But, you know, let, let's look at the world in which we live in right now. There's a, there is a, a form of superficiality around it. And that can create some sense of artificialness. Not everybody needs or should be a peak performer. No. You know, it's, and what is a peak performer? You know, define that. You know, I know, I know men and women that are stay-at-home moms and dads mm. that are the most remarkable parents like phenomenal and they're peak performers in what they do. Yeah. We, you know, it's often that you've got to have the, the faster car and the, um, you know, the, the, the better place to live and, and all of these things in order to gain. But what if you could actually still do that and you don't have to be a peak performer. Not everybody has to be a leader. Not everybody has to climb mountains. Not mm -hmm. everybody has to be a pro fo um, football, soccer, I call it, player. Um, you know, not everybody has to do that. And like you say, and like what you do with your clients, that's okay too. Mm -hmm. and don't feel the need to have to keep up with people. If what you're doing right now works for you and you're, and when I say comfortable, I mean comfortable in fact that you're happy with that. But if there's anybody listening to that, this um, podcast and there's something burning in their stomach or they can feel something bubbling mm. and they know that they're meant for something greater, that's when I say step forward, yeah. step up, lean in, lean out, lean sideways, whatever you need to do, that's when you need to change. You know, that's when you need to, to step up to what you do whatever your goal is you know whatever your Everest is um, and that Everest can be anything I, I think you're right I, I, I think social media has its real benefits because um, it enables us to do things like this it enables us to connect with people we would never connect with it increases our reach uh, you know the, the amount of people we can affect across the world but as you so rightly say it, it has its downside as well you know people show their highlight reel they never show the cutting room floor of what goes on in their life it's easy yeah. to to pull the wall over people's eyes in, in some regards. Um, but, you know, it, it, what it doesn't do for me is, you know, it, it doesn't enable people to see what really goes on behind the scenes. So we look at people who are successful. We look at people who are at the top of their game in whatever industry or whatever sport or whatever remit of life we're, we're interested in. And we see these successful people. And we look at where we are and we see that gap and, and the gap is like a, it's like a chasm, you know, to, to coin a, yeah. a mountain. See, see what I'm doing here. I'm, I'm kind of making it. <laughs> um, so we see this giant chasm and we just don't know how or if we can close it. So we don't do it. What we don't see is that successful person was a beginner once. And we don't see their struggles and we don't see what goes on in their life, which is why I think it's amazing that you, you've you decided to, to share your entire story because it's so relevant to so many people. And we have to understand, I think, that, that we are all beginners and we all go on a journey, to, to coin a phrase, and that yeah. that's okay as well, that we don't have to be the finished yeah. article straight away. Yeah, and be comfortable with that. You know, yeah. one of the things that, that we talk a lot about in, in our work is getting comfortable with being uncomfortable mm. and pushing people to the point where, um, you know, I, I had a meeting today with a client and I'm pushing to that point where you are uncomfortable, but knowing that that level of uncomfortableness. So to use an example, so if there's anybody listening to the, the, the podcast who's run, for example, a 5K, a park run, you'll know that if you've never run a park run before, uh, which is a, a five kilometer race all around the world, it, it can sometimes suck. You know, it's, it's, it's challenging. And then once you've done it once or twice and you've gone through the pain, you may have got a blister, you may have overexerted yourself, you might not have hydrated well, your nutrition may have been off. You've been there, you've fallen, you've not done the great things. And then you think, okay, what about a 10K? 
once you've gone through the 10K and then you go through the 21, sorry, 21.1 kilometers, you'll have to help me out in miles, which is a half, um, half marathon. Yeah, 13 point marathon. something miles, I think. <laughs> I need to get the calculator out for that one. Um, and then the same with a, a, a marathon, 42.2. And then you do an ultra marathon. So, and, you know, and I go back to, you know, some of the, the athletic things. But I also go back to some of the things that I have gone wrong in terms of like losing my mum. There is no other pain that I can experience in my life that would ever be as bad as losing my mom. Right. Emotional pain. So if somebody was to do something um, you know, against me or my family, nothing could ever be that bad. Mm. It would hurt. Of course it would. But nothing could ever be that bad because we've almost, we've been there, we've experienced it, we've got the coping strategies in place. You know, it's the same with the ultra marathons. You know, I've run the 24 hour race, the 100K race, 85 kilometers, 50 kilometers. Nothing could ever be as bad as running a 24 hour race on a, um, you know, suspected stress fracture. So now when someone says to don't me, Don't try oh, that at home, kids, by the way. I've got to rem- say that. Yeah, don't do that. Don't do what the, what, don't do what the ultra marathon I just said on the podcast. Um, so what I'm suggesting is that once you've pushed to that upper limit, mm. nothing could ever be that challenging again. Mm. So think about it from a qualification perspective. You know, once you've done your certificate, diploma, and if for those of you that, you know, go on to degrees and masters and PhDs, nothing can ever be, once you've reached that pinnacle, whatever your pinnacle is, nothing could ever be that bad again. So why not push, get the coping strategies in place, you know, that deliberate practice to get you there. Nothing will ever be as challenging as the first challenge that you did when you were a beginner. <coughs> Absolutely. Um, uh, 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 it, it, it's interesting. Uh, we, we've spoken an awful lot about peak performance because that's what we do. Uh, you know, we, yeah. we, we work at a peak level ourselves, you know, and, and we try and optimize our lives. Um, we encourage everyone to find something that they want to attain a, a higher level in and master in. Um, what would you say, Belinda, are your peak performance habits? What do you do daily that keep you in that state, that optimal state, that flow state that can have you performing at a peak level? Um, firstly, I want to be, I want to flip it and say, and be real about this, that yes, I have the habits and I have the rituals and I have the pillars, you know, the core pillars of performance, Mm. but I also break, you know, things sometimes don't work. Mm. For example, I'm still injured. I'm still injured from last year and still recovering. And then I keep getting re-injured again. So I want to flip it on its head firstly and say that, habits and rituals are incredibly important and 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 you've worked with you know some of the the most elite high high performers as well that the ones that are the most successful have the strongest rituals Mm. and they follow through on them every day but i also just wanted to put a caveat to that that no matter how organized and how ritualistic you are the reality is the coping strategies are most probably the most important out of all Mm. that so you know around nutrition Mm-hmm. is an incredible pillar and um, also having um, recovery so sleep and recovery right. um, also having um, a, an element of how can I perform and I try to separate elements out of my uh, out of my life so the love aspect so how do I show up when I love and love isn't just about you know romantic love mm-hmm. now it's showing love for others yeah. um, and it's showing caring and compassion so there's particular habits and rituals and then, you know, going into things like recovery, for example, you know, I have to do because of my leg, I have to do up to a, you know, half an hour to an hour every single day of exercise and stretching and rehab right. that, you know, maybe someone who has a slightly more functioning leg doesn't have to do. So, um, you know, it's about nutrition, it's about movement, it's about business, it's about love um, it's about recovery as well as another good one and sleep. So, and then obviously breaking those down into, you know, each of them is broken down into segments that I have to do every day. And it's very, very highly structured, really structured. What's non-negotiable for you? Exercise. Right. So that has to happen no matter what's going on in your life now. Yeah. Breathe, sleep, train. Right. Repeat. 
breathe, sleep, train, repeat. <laughs> when you're um, training for some, uh, uh, like something like an ultra marathon, I know it's something I've never done. I, you know, I'm an explosive athlete. I was a goalkeeper. I was a boxer. I power lifted. I've done strongman, short bursts of high intensity stuff, hundred meter sprints, maybe at a push 200 meter, but let's not get carried away. So I have <laughs> no experience whatsoever with, uh, ultra, with the marathon running, let alone ultra marathon running. What's, a recovery process like that for because that must create an awful lot of strain on you physically and mentally yeah yeah it does but look let, let's reflect upon you know using this when you've had a particularly stressful period at work for example or if you're in business for those of you that are listening in business you know there'll be high demand areas where you need to perform and i always go back to athletes you know, so we have our peak season, our off season, recovery. Mm. So in answer to your question, in terms of recovery, you know, it's about the food that you eat, you know, mm. making sure, for example, that you've got your carbs, your proteins, yeah. cherries, for example, um, you know, using all the, the science and the technology. And um, one of our mutual friends um, who runs um, SJ Nutrition, you yeah. know, one of the things that, you know, I spoke to him about is making sure that you have your nutrition yeah. and that's, and that's not difficult by the way and um, but it, again it takes you studying that area so you know you need to do a little bit of study in that area and then it's like cryo for example i use cryo and recovery trousers right. um, rollering those types of techniques and impact because obviously as you can imagine with um, the leg it creates additional um biomechanical challenges yes. is what i call yes. them Right. So I put extra pressure through the other side of my legs, which then creates injuries. So it's about having orthotics. It's about having um, recovery exercises that I have to do every day, you know, seeing a physio, seeing a specialist. And again, it's about being ritualistic and having those rituals in place. Some are negotiable. And I'm telling you right now, my, if my physio ever listens to this, He'll be shaking his head. I can see him now. I can see Blaine shaking his head. But sometimes the wheels fall off. Like, for example, today, um, you know, it was an hour and a half sleep because I wanted to make sure that I achieved everything that I needed yeah. to do. Have I done my exercises at five o'clock this morning? No. Will I do them later? Absolutely. I just shift. Yeah. It's about being flexible. About being flexible, definitely. Um, it's interesting. Anti-aging is another one, Paul, as well. Sorry, Belinda. Um, something um, we, we don't really talk about so much in Australia. Um, and even so, in, I'm currently located in, in the Middle East as well. Anti-aging for the joints. Right. So it's, you know, it's along the lines of the biohacking, and, I, and I'm sure you've had biohacking specialist on. But looking at anti-aging, we do it for the face men and women, mm -hmm. you know, we put the creams and the solutions and the injectables and all of those things, but we don't do the same for our bodies. No. So the treatments, you know, um, David Asprey's book, um, and there's many other biohackers out there as well that have spent quite a bit of time looking at anti-aging for our joints and our bodies. Now more than ever, we're at a tipping point of, of change when it mm. comes to that, you know, as a, 40 ish something woman, then I we'll edit that. Have... Don't worry. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm hoping that the, the podcast will, um, will fade at that point. And, you know, there's, and as a pro athlete yourself and people listening to the, um, to the podcast, aging is inevitable. Yeah. We know that absolutely aging is inevitable, but there are things that we can do to prolong that so that we don't have to be in as much pain as we used to be five and 10 and 15 and 20 and 30 years ago. So there's a lot of things now that we can do. And, you know, I'd ask that everybody who's listening, who thinks what, you know, what's she talking about, you know, to either reach out to you or to myself or Dr. Google and find out a little bit more about anti-aging for the mm -hmm. joints, because we are so privileged now to have the treatments that we have that can prolong our joints, ligaments, tendons for a lot longer than we've ever had before. So we can yeah. go and break ourselves some more. And we keep <laughs> functional and, and the more functional we are, the, 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 the higher optimal our lifestyle is. And it, it, you know, it, it all brings it nicely around. I, I just want to touch on one thing. Um, you, you, you spoke very eloquently uh, about your recovery protocols, but, we also need recovery protocols in other areas of our life, right? We're, we're in this uh, uh, time now where there's a lot of 
um, hustle, grind mentality, work, 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 you rest when you're dead and all this sort of thing. And for me, I, you know, you're going to fall foul of that myth, uh, I think, you need to work like interval training, right? In bursts, Absolutely. you need to have periods of focus work and then you back it off for a period of recovery, periods of focus work. Um, that's what makes a peak performer. That's what makes optimal living. And that's what, what helps leaders lead, um, in my opinion. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I'm so glad you raised that because, you know, we have athletes have off seasons, you know, we have yeah. pre-season, we have off seasons, but as leaders, when do we do that? And that's something that I know you work with, with your clients and we work with our clients on is allowing them the space to know that it's okay, mm -hmm. that they don't have to be. I mean, we create the happiest workplaces on the planet. That's what, you know, that's what I'm here to do. That's my role. And that's what my company does. Are those companies hundred percent happy all of the time? Absolutely not. You know, are we switched on all of the time? Absolutely not. Because it's physically impossible. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Physically impossible to do that. So you can't be happy. You can't be a peak performer 100% of the time. There are times when you need to hit the reset button. Mm. And, you know, something I know Simon Sinek has been talking about for many years, and there's many other scientists and doctors around the world saying the same that the amount of saturation that we're going through in terms of screen time now mm. is unsustainable. Absolutely. And I'm happy to go on the record with this one because what I'm seeing around the world, and I do a lot of travel, you know, I've been to five countries in the last two days, I think three days. Um, and I saw the same thing happening in, you know, in, in Budapest, in, you know, in Hungary, in London, back here in Dubai, um, you know, that same period of this constantly being switched on. Imagine if we turned a light on now, perhaps a light next to you or, you know, somebody who, who's listening, the light next to the bed or the light in the kitchen and left that light on all the time. You know, to use another example, imagine if I put you on a treadmill now, you and I were on a treadmill and we just had to keep turning 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We wouldn't survive, you know, Not that so light long. globe... Um, you know, that light globe at some point would burn out. Our legs would fatigue, our lactate you know, levels, our lactic acid would be so painful that we wouldn't be able to continue. Mm. But we constantly, I mean, you'll notice that, you know, I would have reached for my device to show you, but when I'm talking, I actually put my device away. So it's mm. not distracting me, no. but you know, we're, we're ever connected to these devices um, and it's, it's not slowing down. So we need to find coping strategies yeah. to switch off. Absolutely. And that's so, so very important. So thank you very much for, for bringing that up. What, what's, what's next for you? you with all this stuff you've got going on and all these challenges you've got. And I know, I know we spent some time together this weekend at an amazing event and I, and I know kind of some of the stuff you've got coming up. It's insane, but let the listeners know the kind of things you've got coming up, Belinda. Um, well, the most important one today was speaking to you. Oh, bless. And we talk about, you know, we've got to do step by step. So, you know, the ability to, I think the ability to, I've got a lot of conferences and events coming up, um, you know, podcasts like these. And then moving on from that, from a, a physiological perspective, um, climbing the seven highest mountains on each continent. I'm currently at number, uh, number four, sorry, I'm at, I've done three. I'm at number four, which is this year. Everest is next year. Um, an ultra marathon, I would like to do a 48 hour event, hopefully this year. So I tend to do 20 or 30 events a year. Wow. The challenge I've set for myself this year is 8,848 kilometers. So I'm going to cover that by any means possible. Right. So, um, and, and the reason why I did that also as well is I know I have to bring in failure. I have to build in injury. Not because I'm defeatist, not because I'm an eternal optimist. Um, you know, I'm definitely, you know, the, the reverse of, of thinking that I'm going to be injured. But that's the reality. You know, yeah. we, we need to know that that's going to happen. So, you know, I've built in by any means possible. So that means I can swim. I can run, I can crawl, I can ski, um, I can bike, I can do the elliptical trainer, um, I can do, you know, water running, whatever it takes. Um, a lot of travel, so doing a, a couple of world tours, doing some great speaking. Um, my book is launching in February, which is the Chief Happiness Officer, um, and then building a team that 
is is changing the workplaces of the world and i think um you know and showing up as the best um you know the best wife i can be um the best family member i can be and i think that's the you know some of the biggest opportunities that i have going on this year as well and you know when i when i repeat it back to you it does sound an awful lot but it's again if I, I i posed a question you were in the room at the weekend paul and i said to you if today was your very last day have you achieved everything you wanted to achieve mm. and it's okay to say yes and it's okay to say no mm. but if the answer is no then what are you going to do about it today you know and it's about you know it's about creating that journey and i know um i've got a, a big journey ahead of me one of the biggest challenges i've got ahead is finishing my phd my doctorate even when i think of it now i take a breath and i think oh, it's another thing to add but again it's about that journey and the view when you get to your journey because the reality is I don't think we'll ever get to that final destination no. point because we keep shifting the goals. But when you get there, imagine the feeling, you know, imagine knowing that you've changed lives. And mm. um, the, the biggest goal we have at Clarity is positively impacting the lives of 1 million and more people globally. Mm. And I'm not stopping until it happens. No. So, you know, like you, you know, you're in enabling and empowering, you know, the people globally to make those shifts. And I think that is also the greatest gift and the greatest opportunity that we've got, you know, coming up over the next couple of years, decades, however long we have on this earth. Oh, it's fabulous. And knowing you as I do, I, I have no doubt that they'll all get done and get done with a plum. Um, where do people find out more about you, Belinda? Oh, we're on, you know, the social media channels and, and look and just reach out. I'm, I'm pretty approachable. I'm pretty real. I'm not one of these CEOs that sits in the ivory tower. Um, you know, I, I love connecting with people as well. So, you know, they can hop onto claritygroup.com, clarity with an I, not a Y. And, um, you know, I'm on social media, you know, under Belinda Jane, LinkedIn. I'm on all the, on all the channels. So yeah, by all means, I would love to connect and I, I would love to commit to coming back on the podcast when I've done the next mountain. In, um, or even after Everest as well you know I'd love to commit and, and come back on and, and I have another chat to you as well and hopefully in one piece <laughs> <laughs> well I'll hold you to that because I'm fascinated to see how that goes and I'm sure our audience is as well and I want to thank you um, for spending an hour of your time with me today and with the audience and um, uh, giving such amazing value um, and content that I'm sure everyone who's been listening will get something out of and be able to utilize in their lives immediately folks remember do it now <laughs> don't wait you've got to make these you know that you've got someone on a now. train right now who's listening to it and they suddenly they've got up yeah. and they're now starting they've got a business plan they're starting a new business and um, they've decided oh. that they're going to climb Kilimanjaro or um, they're going to do something so I know there's trains and planes somewhere in the world now with somebody <laughs> Stood up, say, I'm going to do this. I'm yeah, do that. Stand efforts. up. Let everyone on the carriage know that you're, you're committed. Yeah, no, just yeah. don't care what they say. Let's just do this. Yeah, fab. <laughs> Belinda, thank and love, you. And look, and I just want to say thank great, you as well. Great. Sorry? I just want to say a huge thank you, Paul, to yourself and everybody oh, that's goodness. taken the time out of their incredibly packed days. You know, you're taking the time out from your children, from your work, you know, from your partners, friends, cats, dogs, um, you know, to listen to me. So I'm incredibly blessed. And if you didn't get value, connect with me. And then I will absolutely ensure that everybody who comes into contact, um, you know, receives some form of value. But thank you, Paul. Thank you for what you're doing as well. You're doing incredible work in your peak performance. Um, you know, your coaching business as well. And, you know, you're creating remarkable people that are doing great things so you know i also have to you know be um you know acknowledge what you're doing as well and it's an honor to be a lot you know in the same field as you thank you so very much that's really nice of you to say so and uh, it's been great talking to you and we will do it again soon we absolutely will you have the most beautiful and abundant day won't you i will take care you. everybody that's listening okay bye <laughs>